Uh, so I'm Ramez Nam. You've, you've heard a bit about me. I'm going to talk about the broad swath of how exponential technologies are disrupting industries and businesses and what we can do about it. You've already heard. I'm a computer scientist by training. I write books, mostly science fiction. And I teach with Daniel at Singularity University, where we try to take people educate them on exponential technologies, and encourage them to find ways to apply those to the world's grand challenges to improve the lives of a billion people, which sounds very lofty, but it's actually real. This sort of technology has improved multiple billion of lives already. So the technologies we talk about are computing, robotics, AI, nanotechnology, energy, and what we see is that they all have this exponential function. They all are improving in their price performance every couple years. And when we see this happen, we see a set of four Ds, four steps an industry goes through. First, it gets digitized. Then it gets dematerialized. Then it gets demonetized. And finally, it is democratized. Let's go through what those look like. The digitization of a domain. Well, you've heard a fair bit about self-driving cars. We all hear about it. I don't think there's any in Australia quite yet, but there will be soon. These vehicles are amazing. This is Google's V1 self-driving vehicle. These vehicles have driven about 2 million kilometers on roads right now. They've had 16 accidents. Of those 16, 15 were caused by humans, not by software, and one was caused by software. So they are roughly uh, at least an order of magnitude, at least a factor of 10 safer than humans, and a million people die on roads in vehicle accidents around the world today. In the US alone, if you take the 50 billion hours that Americans spend driving, plus the cost of accidents and the cost of inefficiency, you're talking about a $1 trillion economic surplus given back to the people in some form if these were ubiquitous. Right? So these things are no longer just in the domain of Google. Every manufacturer is working on self-driving vehicles, uh, from Daimler to Ford to General Motors. Uber has 100 of them on the streets of Pittsburgh today. If you call an Uber in Pittsburgh, you might get a self-driving vehicle. They're better than we are as human drivers for a couple of reasons. One is they have better senses. So they see the world around them using LiDAR, the laser version of radar. So they have 360-degree view, no blind spots. Two is that their reflexes are simply far better than you or I. They can respond in microseconds to what it might take us whole seconds to do. They also never get drowsy. They also never have too many glasses of wine before they get behind the road. So I'm going to show you what it's like to drive in a self-driving car or to ride in one. And I apologize in advance. There might be a wee bit of profanity in this video. Ant's team will never believe this. Oh, my goodness. Go is the right word. Holy shit. Holy shit. There's no fucking hands on that wheel. Oh my god. What? It's driving itself. Ah! Ah! <laughs> Now, it's not really like that. They actually drive very politely. They drive like your mother, but very alert, uh, very polite, always exactly the speed limit, as Daniel said. Uh, perhaps that's the scream of taxi drivers, though, as, as Martin Ford was saying. We'll come back to that. Now, there's, a, there's an old Arnold Schwarzenegger film where he gets in a taxi cab, and there's a robot behind the wheel driving. And that's a naive version of what self-driving cars might be like. But actually it enables more radical transformation of what transportation is like. So imagine that your vehicle is now a place where you can work or be entertained or sleep or do whatever it is that you want to do. It's not just that something else is doing the driving, it's that this time is given back to our lives or to our economy. It has other implications. Uber just bought this startup, Auto, a little over a year old, a billion dollars for this self-driving trucking startup. Truckers can drive eight to 10 hours legally in most countries. Imagine self-driving trucks that can go 2,000 kilometers a day with almost no accidents. They can convoy behind each other, save 30% of fuel, 30% of carbon emissions, and now you can ship on ground something that is almost as fast as air, but at a fraction of the cost, a fraction of the energy and climate impact. So it, with self-driving cars, we see this remarkable phenomenon, which is 10 years ago, they simply did not work, and they were nowhere on the horizon. DARPA had contests for self-driving vehicles, and nothing 
nothing could finish a course, nothing could go more than a few hundred meters. And then eight years ago, a team finished the course, and then Google acquired that team. So we have this perception in industry after industry and in all of human society that we go from no change to suddenly radical change all at once. But really, that's an illusion of how we look at things. That's a linear view of things. What's actually happening is exponential. And Daniel used this example yesterday at lunch to think about the difference. If I take 30 strides, I'll hit the back of the room, I'll go about 30 meters. If I take 30 exponential strides, and each stride is doubling in length, two meters, four meters, eight meters, then I won't go 30 meters, I'll go a billion meters, or 26 times around the Earth, right? That's compounding interest, if you will. It, every step is bigger than the last. And because every step is bigger than the last, in exponential technologies, we often see that when the initial steps are tiny, you're following that green curve, and you're seeing what looks like no progress at all. And it looks like this new technology is simply useless a digital camera that has 100 pixels, a 3D printer that prints one widget in a week. Those things are not useful to us at all. But if that's doubling, 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 then at some point it crosses the threshold of being very relevant, and then suddenly we're amazed at how fast change is happening. So Vinod Khosla looked at this for mobile phones. Industry analysts drew the orange lines. Here's how fast they expected mobile phones to grow, linear growth. Uh, but he looks at the actual trajectory, and it was exponential. We have a bias that the future will look like the past, but it usually doesn't. You, AI is one of these areas where we're seeing rapid transformations. Uh, IBM, 15 years ago, beat the world chess master with Deep Blue. People said, can you play a more unstructured game, a bigger, more open, more human-like game? So they took Watson to Jeopardy, and they didn't just win against humans, they won against the two all-time world champions at a game that is much less structured. Uh, Google took their deep learning technology and applied it to the game of Go. Two years ago, the best Go computer could not beat a talented teenager. They beat the world grandmaster in Go four games out of five. And of course, while there's money to be made playing uh, Go or playing Jeopardy, there's much more money to be made applying AI to big industries, to healthcare, to uh, finance, to energy exploration, to engineering. And that's where companies are taking this. And yes, it does threaten jobs. It also creates abundance by bringing down the cost and increasing the quality of all of those products. But it's not just in software. Energy, this is what I write about most. In solar power, we've seen a shrinkage in the cost of a watt of solar power of 200x in the last 40 years, unlike anything else, such that now the cheapest solar power in the world is half the price of coal or natural gas if you're in a sunny place like Dubai. And it's Similar things are happening in other clean energy technologies, like energy storage, uh, and that's applying to things like transportation, electric vehicles. This is a Tesla Model S. It's a great vehicle. It's a spaceship, really, inside. The cockpit is like that. Or really, it's a computer on wheels. So Tesla doesn't just sell you a product. They update that product automatically in the middle of the night for you. So one morning, Tesla's already the fastest street legal vehicle. One morning, Tesla owners woke up, Tesla Model S owners, with an email saying, we've added a new feature to your car. And that it wasn't a recall, it wasn't, hey, come into the shop, we're going to tune something. It's you wake up and a new feature is there. And that feature was this, insane mode. The, the Tesla Model S was already the fastest vehicle, but Elon was not satisfied with that. So let me show you what insane mode looks like. And again, I apologize for the profanity. I'm, I'm really mad that the option is insane. Like, it's not like just... Boy, that's that, perfect. That's, Isn't that good? That's a random, like... Because the, the car is insane, right? <laughs> Everyone thinks the car is insane, so why not have, you know, like an insane mode, right? That makes sense. So you just come to, like, a complete stop. All right. And then before you know it... You oh, oh, shit, Brooks! <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> oh. 70 miles an hour. Brooks, oh shit. Yo, first of all, you can't fucking do that to people. Like, you gotta give people fair warning. Why? Like, you can't fucking just say, yeah, you can. Brooks, what? I think I shit it in your seat. No, <laughs> oh. So that's an $80,000 car, quite expensive, but it outperforms half a million dollar supercars. And of course, Tesla didn't stop there, because with these exponential technologies, the performance has improved. Suddenly, we went from electric cars we thought were going to be toys, clunkers, to being the fastest cars, but the price also comes down. So the average price of a new car in the US is a Toyota Camry at $32,500. For the same amount of money next year, you can buy a Tesla Model S that's a luxury vehicle, spaceship with self-driving features that accelerates faster than the fastest Porsche. What are you going to buy, right? 
other technologies. The, the first Google self-driving car used a $70,000 LiDAR system. Now you can buy a system as good as that for $250, or you can buy easier LiDAR, simpler LiDAR, for now about $60, right? That plunge in price enables new things. Sensors are getting to the point where they're much smaller than a penny and where they cost pennies. And that means they will be everywhere and will be swimming in data. And the challenge will be, what do we do with that data? How do we get insights out of that data? And that is going to be the role of AI and machine learning and trained humans. 3D printing. This was a 30-year-old technology that for decades was totally irrelevant. Then, five years ago, hey, it was cool for printing plastic. You could prototype pieces quickly. You could iterate on your design quickly, and that's great for speed of innovation. But they were still just plastic toys, totally useless, except now we print in metal. This is a laser metal sintering device. It's using a laser on a bed of powdered metal to make metal parts. You can prototype quickly, but now we actually make parts that go into airplanes, cars, spaceships using this technology. You saw some of these at Monash last night. You see you can make everything from very fine, detailed gears to high fashion to prosthetics, as we've seen. Or if you're SpaceX, you make the engines of your Falcon 9 rockets using 3D printing. They 3D print in titanium and uh, nickel. And they do this because they can achieve shapes they couldn't achieve. They can cut the number of parts in this engine by a factor of five. They can increase its performance. And because they can iterate on the design every three or four days and test it again, instead of having a multi-month or multi-year cycle to test out their engines. And that speed of iteration is what wins in the long run. Martin Ford talked about robotics. Robots used to be extremely brittle in their behavior. Now they can take chaos and disorder coming in and apply order to it. Or well, now we have robots like Baxter that uh, isn't programmed, he's taught. You move Baxter's hands around in the task you want. He has cameras in his palms, uses computer vision to figure out what it is you want him to do. Most of this is really driven by Moore's Law, which is the continuous doubling of the amount of computing you can buy per dollar. Every 18 months, you can buy twice as much computing per dollar. That means every 10 years, you can buy 100 times as much computing per dollar. Every 20 years, it's 10,000 times. Every 30 years, it's a million times. The easy way to think about this is the cost of computing goes to zero. Google tells their engineers, what could you do if computation was free? If it data storage was free, if memory was free. And that's how they dream up what's going to be big 10 years from now. Or Mark Andreessen, who created Netscape, says software is eating the world, which means that every company must be a software company to succeed. Not that that's your only product, but if you're not taking advantage of this transformation in your business, you're about to be disrupted by someone who is. And we see there are winners and losers in this. You all know this story, right? We forget that Kodak invented the digital camera but they didn't adopt it because they underestimated its potential and because they didn't want to disrupt their own business model of selling film. Well, their competitors did not ask Kodak's permission to disrupt uh, the film business, and it's good for all of us as consumers, but too bad Kodak lost 90% of its employees and went bankrupt, right? And we drive into this and we see the marginal cost of photography used to be high. Every shot counted. Now it's zero. Who cares how many shots we take? And now we do it, use it for other things. We take pictures of our dinner, of where we parked, of a funny sign. We take eight selfies to pick the best one, right? And that means the problem space has shifted. What company makes the most money off of photography? If you were not in my session yesterday. Facebook. Facebook, Patricia got it right. Because Facebook doesn't do photography, but they make billions off of people sharing those photos. We've gone from a scarcity model of each picture counts to an abundance model of what am I going to do with all these pictures. Clayton Christensen wrote about this phenomena in a book called The Innovator's Dilemma, which I highly recommend, which is that market leaders have a great technology and a great business model, and they iterate on it slowly. And they see some new technology that initially is very poor quality, but it's improving rapidly, they ignore it, either because they don't believe in it or because it disrupts their business model. And then a new entrant that has nothing to lose uses that technology, disrupts the business model of the incumbent. And the dilemma is, how do you get off your butt and actually try to disrupt yourself instead of being disrupted by somebody else? Ram is one minute, huh? All right. So we, you know a whole lot of this. I'm just going to go uh, rapidly here. But I will say this also means demonetization. If you look at the news business, newspapers have lost almost all of their revenue, even as it's the golden age of news for consumers. And fundamentally, it democratizes power to people. You all know Gordon Gecko from Wall Street. This was his cell phone. 
All right, this is the Motorola <laughs> Dynatac. This is the average cell phone on the planet today, the average cell phone user, a $35 phone that far exceeds the performance of that. There's more phones in Africa than in North America. There's going to be half a billion smartphones in India by the end of next year. We have real-time speech translation coming. And while I agree with Martin that there's good reason to fear the loss of jobs, we also have things like MIT committing to put 100% of their curriculum online for free. So how do you be a winner and not a loser in this market? And this is where I want to wrap up. Well, we are evolved to fear change. And when we fear change, we become paralyzed or we jump in the wrong direction. Our wetware is not wired for this modern world. And we see that change affects not just individuals, but organizations. Most of the Fortune 500 from the mid-century are gone. And that lifespan of an S&P 500 company has dropped by a factor of four over the last century. Disruption comes faster. So I'll recommend a second book in terms of how to optimize for change. It's my friend Salim Ismail's book, Exponential Organizations. He teaches at Singularity University as well. And he says really focus on three things. One, have a clear, massive transformative purpose that you can articulate. Two is look for force multipliers, his acronym is SCALE, where you can staff on demand, you can leverage resources that aren't yours. And three, focus on being an innovation factory, increasing the rate of innovation, leveraging the brain power of your people. And the biggest thing there is really giving them autonomy and experimenting. At Amazon, executives don't decide what goes on the Amazon homepage. They don't decide what algorithms are used. Experiments do. Individual Individual programmers, 21 years old, fresh out of college, can say, I'm going to run an experiment. They just do it, and they see what the data says, and that's what wins. And that's how Amazon is continually updating and refreshing itself. It's really the power of using science. So at the end of the day, your competitors will not ask your permission to disrupt yourself. And I'll leave you with a quote from Charles Darwin that said, it's not the strongest of the species that survives, but it's that which is most adaptable to change. Thank you very much. All right.